intro, and I only have 10 minutes, so that means that this is very hard for me. I can't talk for very long, so I'm going to try and make it brief. First off, this is your, what, fourth session of your class. I hope you are having a wonderful time and learning a lot. This class, this particular session, is usually everybody's favorite session of the entire class. We do course evaluation at the end. We say, you know, what did you like, what did you not like, and all that good stuff, which you'll get a chance to do. Propagations usually because you actually get to do something as opposed to listen to people talk. So with that in mind, I'm going to try and stop not talk very much. Um, but if you have any questions as you go along, please feel free to ask. So, propagation. It's really, how many of you have kids? <laughs> okay. If, if you have kids, you understand what propagation is. It's a process of actually increasing the population or something, right? And then sometimes you're wondering, like, why did I do that? <laughs> uh, so, it, it is trying to increase. Now there are a number of different ways to do it. We're going to cover not all of them, but most of them today. At least talk about them. You'll get to do some of them. Uh, and it's basically applied plant physiology. See, so you had botany or plant growth last week, right? So Correct. you know all this stuff. Mm -hmm. Right? Oh, sure. No. Okay. <laughs> it's a process. So it's a process that continues until the plant is on its own. And for those of you who have kids, you know that is never, never. right? It's like not, not happening. Um, now, this is the way the class is going to work. We get to talk, that is we, me, Claire, Cynthia. We don't let Paul talk anymore. He's had his. Uh, and, and then you get to go do. And you're going to get to go out to the Big Red Barn Garden. Now, how, I know at least some of you have been out here before. How many of you have been to the, to the garden before? I, I know. So, some of you didn't know it. The, the Big Red Barn Garden is primarily a demonstration garden. It is intended to provide plants for school tours. The, the, the foundation here has school tours that will be starting for the fall tours uh, at the end of September, which starts tomorrow, that's what I believe. Um, and the, we have stuff and the kids get to go see how plants are grown, where the vegetables actually come from and not out of HEB. Um, and it's amazing, some of them are very knowledgeable when you do the, and some of them are going, huh? That's not where we get our stuff. Uh, so, and the other thing that we do is we make donations of our produce, and I volunteer out here, uh, to the Christian Cover, which is a local, how many people are from Seguin? Some of you, okay. So some of you know what I'm talking about, some of you don't. Christian Cover is a local food pantry, okay, and I have to be on the board there. So I make sure I scarf up all the stuff and, and take it out there. Um, so, We'll do lecture, demonstration, practical acts. Oh, I wanted to talk about one other thing real quick. I know, Paul, I know. Uh, the school tours. For those of you who have passed your uh, uh, background, have taken the course, they didn't used to do this, it's new this year. So, uh, who have taken the course and passed, we will be offering you the opportunity to participate in school tours. Um, and actually think that probably within the next week or so I'll get it to Tim or Paul so that you get first dibs on signing up because I remember when I was a trainee it's where can I get hours. Mm -hmm. The first class I coordinated my brother-in-law happened to be in it which was never mind. Um, and after that every time I'd ask him to do something he said can I get hours for that. So, you haven't quite gotten into the flow yet, but trust me, you will. Um, what we're going to talk about today, you, we, we'll uh, actually do demonstrations out in the garden. Thank you, Paul. 
We have two Pauls, Paul 1 and Paul 2. Oh. Paul 2 is our camera person. We promised to get my good side. <laughs> he just hasn't figured out which side no, that is. They're both good. So, uh huh. Um, and so then you'll go out and, if necessary, we'll show you what to do. And, um, and then you do. So that's the way it will work. So the way this goes is Claire. Claire is sitting at the back of the room back there. Claire Heminger will talk about sexual propagation. That's seeds. Uh, I'm going to talk about asexual propagation. That's everything but seeds. And the one exception on the everything but seeds is division, which Cynthia Lissy back there is going to do. So that's, that's basically how and, and, and uh, Paul Lund introduced the table angels. Um, so why propagate? One, you want more of a plant. I really like that plant. Or you want to share it with somebody. My neighbor really likes that plant. Um, or you find a plant growing someplace that you'd really like to have. I know none of you would ever do this, but I do a, one of my childhood memories, and I am gonna shut up here in a second. I grew up in Southern California, and one of my childhood memories is my mother taking my sis, my younger sister and I, I was maybe nine or 10, to Carmel Mission. Beautiful courtyard garden. Pat and I are standing guard while my mother is taking cuttings off the plants <laughs> in the garden. And I'm going, Mom, we're going to get caught. We're going to throw in jail. This is, this is a mission. I mean, you're not supposed to be doing this. So I obviously have a you know, family tradition. <laughs> um, so and we all so used to stop alongside of the road when we would be driving someplace. Anybody else had that experience with your family? Okay, or done it yourself. Um, to develop a new hybrid, which we will not be getting far enough into propagation with this particular class to do hybridization, but that is one of the reasons. And for plant sales. Now, we're not going to be using plants for plant sales so much anymore because of some changed and some, some rules, but that was used to be a primary reason why Master Gardeners grew. That was, is our primary fundraising plant sales. You'll, you'll learn more later. So, what is soil? It depends on who you ask. If you ask a geologist, my brother-in-law happens to be a geologist, it's eroded geologic material. In other words, it's rock that got worn away to tiny little granules. If you ask a gardener, it's stuff you grow. Yeah, right. I mean, why else would it exist if you plant plants? Um, so you need to kind of know the difference. Potting mix, when we've got potting mix out there for you to work with, is controlled soil. It has a controlled pH. It can have or not have fertilizer, depending on what you're doing with it. Um, garden soil happens to be the soil that just is in the ground. You generally do not want to plant seeds with some exceptions, now there are seeds that get planted directly in the garden, but if you're doing a delicate plant or something, you generally want to control soil, cuttings, controlled soil, so uh, you need to know the difference. Know your dirt. How many of you have sent in your soil test? Please raise your hands. If you have not, please do so. First off, you'll have people talking about it for the entire class. And it's really, really valuable information. Okay, be clean. Now, you don't have to be sterile. We generally don't work in environments that lend itself to being sterile. That is like the operating room or something like that. Um, but you do need to make sure your tools are disinfected periodically so that you're not carrying harmful organism from one plant to another. You also need to make sure that, that, that you're minimizing by doing that contamination by contact, obviously. Um, 
Some of the media I will talk about using is uh, perlite, vermiculite, and sphagnum moss for uh, uh, doing seeds and cuttings. Although I will say this, I have had perfectly good luck just using potting soil, particularly potting soil that does not have fertilizer in it. Uh, now, anybody here know what perlite is? What is it? <laughs> just, just do what I would do. Of course, I would ask you. Anybody know? <laughs> it's um, it, it's a material that allows um, air to go through the soil. It is. That's what we use it for. It it breaks up soil. It makes it. But it is made out. Yes, I know, Paul. I'm shutting up in a minute. It is made out of volcanic glass. Vermiculite, yeah. on the other hand, and this is why you use a mix. Vermiculite holds water. Actually, both hold water to some extent. It's just that vermiculite does it much better. And vermiculite is a mineral. It's a naturally occurring mineral. And it's used to hold moisture in. Sphagnum moss is exactly what it sounds like. It's a naturally growing moss. Um, ideally, you use dist distilled water. Most of us don't do that, but it does keep things like here we have a lot of calcium in our water. It, it, it minimizes whatever happens to be in your local water that might inhibit growth. Uh, make sure you use clean containers, gloves if you like. Some people prefer to get dirt under their fingernails. Okay, potting up means starting little, moving it up from little to big, and ultimately, if the goal is to, not to be a potted plant, but to go into putting it in the garden. So when you hear people talk about potting up or bumping up, that's what they're talking about. Good luck with the controlling the sun thing. <laughs> uh, so, but to the extent that you can, when you have seedlings or cutting, control the environment. There's lots of good books out there. If you don't have one, I suggest you do a little shopping around. Also, use the internet. It's a great source of information. Just be careful what the source that you're looking at is. Uh, okay, you can look at horticultural information. Texas A&M's got some great stuff on the internet. Um, so make sure it's a reputable site. I'm shutting up now, Paul. <laughs>
sexual, the pros and the cons. I hope y'all can see behind my head, sorry. I'm gonna just go do this, I can go. Uh, seeds, the pros for seeds is that they're cheap and they're easy. Um, most seed stores sell them and you've got the wide variety. And the commercial seeds, there's high standards of what those seeds, what you're gonna get. Um, there's also the possibility of variability, which can be a good thing for developing new types and cultivars. The cons, you have the lack of uniformity. This is especially true of seed collected in the wild or in your garden. The other one, for me, is the impatient one. It takes longer for maturity from seed. Uh, the plants grow from, growing from seed will generally take longer to come to maturity Whereas plants, mm -hmm. yeah, plants that you purchase or are propagated or whatever, they're going to come to maturity and bloom or produce faster than from seed. I went backwards. There we go. You talked about this stuff last week, and I'm not even going to touch it because. This is about the sexual part. These are the plants, the, what the pollen and the um, stuff does. You, you touched on, I'm not gonna talk about it, but it's about our flowering plants that have sexual propagation. Um, oh gosh, I've gone too far. There we go. We have some plants that need to be pollinated, and then we have others that self-pollinate. And you can look that up yourself and figure out what it is that you need. Um, there are some plants that are need cross-pollination. Uh, I know of some fruit trees that you need to have two trees near each other so that they can cross-pollinate. If you don't have them, you may not get your fruit. Uh, Here's an example of the variety and cross-pollinization of what you can get. <laughs> so now I can interrupt just yes. for a second, I apologize, but when she talks about cross-pollination, where a lot of people will make a mistake, I'm gonna go out and buy a peach tree. Yeah. Or they may go out and have design on a different type of a, a fruit tree, but they don't do their research. And what you should do, because you'll, do your research on a peach tree or any other fruit tree or whatever, and it will tell you if they need cross-pollination. Cross that way you buy the peach tree, you put it in the ground, and if it never blooms, well, that's part of the reason why, okay? But do your research when you do invest your dollar, hard-earned dollars, in purchasing a particular fruit tree if they need cross-pollination, okay? Thank you. Thank you, Tim. And I am going too fast. I need to slow down. So, yes, uh, cross-pollination and in your individual gardens, over time and experience, you will get to experiment to see what you come up with and failures and successes. Um, hybrid seeds, that's where you're taking from two plants and with our pollinators, they are combining the genes from different plants together. So you can get variation here and the combination of the two contributors to the pollen to get something different. Whereas if you have self-pollinating, well then you're gonna have more of the same over and over. Sometimes that's good, sometimes that's not what you want. Uh, hybrid seed. This is a chance for us to improve uh, both uh, our commercial producers or the corn producers, the, the maize. They want the highest yield, they want disease resistance, they want to be able to spray whatever and get that yield or drought. The same thing in our gardens, whether it be the flowers, we want the prettiest. We want the bugs not to eat on them. We want them to last a long time. So hybrid seed is a chance to improve those things. Collection.
question. Uh, seeds are best stored in sealed containers at low relative humidity under cool conditions. The back of the car or in the glove box K, a mother's K's car, is not the place to store seeds, especially for long periods of time. Um, they're gonna, it, in the heat, they're gonna bake, and that's not good for the viability of the seed. Uh, Ziploc bags and plastic containers are excellent to hold the seed. Um, and silica gels uh, that you get in your new purses or uh, your pill bottles have silica gels in there. Those are good to put in there, and uh, when you use the seed, you can always take those out, microwave them, and reuse them. Or like my husband does, he'll stick a, paper, a dry paper towel in there, just to help the humidity stay down. Um, the sealed containers can then be put in a refrigerator, not a freezer, for the storage. And many seed will last for years under this type of environment. Um, I know my husband has, we have a refrigerator, the bottom drawer is full of seed packets and we've got years and let me see if I can, well, there you go. You need to date it and your description of what's on there. And um, to be, so you'll know what you have. You sit, hold up some seed and you go, I have no idea. Not unless you really know your seed. Uh, one thing that uh, we have now, new with the Master Gardeners is a seed exchange. It's upstairs at the AgriLife building in the Master Gardeners library and uh, it's under the care of Ernestine Sykes and uh, it's a new program where we're trying to trade out seed. Stuff that has done well in our area, our conditions, our whatever and um, it's a way to share and like for example my husband has um, some pole beans that has been in his family for over 60 years here in Guadalupe County. And it was given to them by someone else. So I need to gather up some extra pole beans and they do great here, except for August. But uh, <laughs> it's an example to share stuff that works, that's good, that's worked, that's reliable. So uh, seeds, seeds are great. Um, let me back up. I skipped something. I did. I skipped something. That must have been the one with the X on it. Um, I did skip a whole bunch. I'll try to come back to that. I did. I skipped a whole bunch. Um, one of the things, uh, another thing we can do is if all else fails, you can purchase your seed uh, at any of your garden centers, your big box, your, your uh, farm and ranch, and you can get reliable seed. I'm going to discuss just a little bit at the very end uh, how we're going to follow some of those instructions. Um, can, I ask, can I ask a question? Yes. Uh, we need to store our seeds in paper bags. That paper bag, I have a lot of them. Do I need to go back and put them in plastic? To keep the moisture low. If you've got it, I have them in a paper bag in a box on top yeah. of the refrigerator. So. You want them in a controlled environment. You don't want them too hot, they'll okay. dry out. They'll dry out. That could be too low of humidity. Okay. So for them to last more than a couple of years, mm -hmm. you can put them in that uh, plastic bag. That way during the winter when your heat's on in your house and your humidity is really low, you've got it in a set level, fixed level. Thank you. Yeah. All right. How did something happen? Okay. Um, and some other things that, that uh, is out there, especially on the commercial level, is treated seeds. I don't know that uh, we may see that. Um, we might, where uh, we will buy uh, the seed that already has a fungicide on it or an antimicrobial to help that seed when it's in the ground so that it can already, it's ready to go to fight to live. 
Um, we may not have that so much in our purchasing, but it definitely in the commercial, they've, they've got that going. All right. What do seeds need to germinate? All of them need water and oxygen and the proper temperature to germinate. And that's something we're gonna have to read about on that temperature, especially. Um, and then the light, how much light do they need? There's some uh, in your book, I just reread it. Uh, some of your lighter, finer seeds generally need more light, whereas your deeper, bigger seeds need to be deeper to get away from the light. Did y'all read that? Mm -hmm. I read that. I read that. Mm -hmm. Did they change the <coughs> Okay. So anyway, um, they all need these requirements. So you're going to have to know before you, you plant to help improve your success rate. You need to know what you're doing. Yes. On the, on the temperature, is that the temperature outside or is that the temperature of the soil? Soil. Okay. Well, both, but primarily soil for when that seed's going to start to do its thing. It's about its immediate environment. Soil. Yes, ma'am. So, uh, on the package it'll say soil temperature. Is there a point where it's too hot? Can be like you know, like, like now, like now. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. So, is there like an average? Like, within a thirty degree, it says to be seventy. So, don't like. It seems like everything past a hundred for so many days is good. Yeah, and it depends on the what it is you're growing. If you're growing something that's come from near the equator, they can handle the higher temperatures. And I can't think of an example right now. Well, I was seeing with yesterday, we, we put radishes in, and they're happening at the demonstration garden in the church. And it's, it happens so fast that I think they have a chance to, to harvest, because yeah. there's not very many days. Yes. Um, but things that might be longer, like getting, you know, all of that, with that, because the temperature is still yes. hot by the time the plant's like, yes. We're gonna we're gonna get into that. So okay. what she's kind of like saying also, you know, we are in the middle of a very very hot season again this year. Uh, my experience, and I don't know if Beth or, or, or Kay or Cynthia may want to add to it, but for example, we're going to an activity. She's going to have us plant some basil seeds. Typically, most basil seeds will germinate within seven to ten days. I planted some about a month ago, and they popped up to the ground in three days because they were in this little bit of shade, a little bit of sun, but the shade was enough to keep them out of that 105, 104 degree temperature. So then that soil is even warmer than what we would think it would be, but they germinated very, very quickly. And now they're about four to five inches tall and we'll eventually be planting them out here in the demonstration garden later this fall. But. Uh, and basil it's like, you know, seed. it's a little bit here and a little bit there. Mm -hmm. You know, you just have to kind of play with it all, mm -hmm. with the temps and the wind and everything else. I'm basil. sorry, go ahead. Yeah, basil likes heat. Um, viability. Uh, this, again, was in your chapter, uh, the cut and float test. I have not tested any seed. I don't know if anybody else. I know some of your purchase seed, they don't give you enough to test. Your every little seed is precious. So uh, if you get to the point where maybe you have something that's a couple of three years old and you don't know if it's viable, you can try these tests. Let's see. Yes, like putting a wet paper towel in a baggie and letting the seed germinate in a uh, there you go, a little controlled environment. Mm -hmm. Just to see if a few of the seeds are viable. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm gonna keep going. Or I can wing it. I'm gonna wing it, I'm gonna wing it. Okay, um, shoot, I wish I had that. No. I'm not. I'm going to keep going. <laughs> okay. All right. So we are for seeds, sexual. We are talking about angiosperms, flowering plants. And they generally have two classes, monocots and dicots. Again, it's in your book. 
So, Monica, uh, you've read all the definitions of what they're doing and dicots, what they do. I see, I can see two examples right there. On the left, I see a kernel of corn. A single kernel of corn, and you know how that leaf, well, you see how they come up? It's a single stalk. Mm -hmm. On the right, dicots. I see a pecan in a shell where it's got two halves. Mm -hmm. Walnut, you, you can pick many things. That's how, I mean, that just jumps out at me. And uh, these things come into play. Well, here's some more uh, uh, the descriptions of them. Uh, the monocots are grains and corn, wheat, rice, onion, garlic, chives, aloe vera, iris, daffodil, daylilies. And the dicot examples are your legumes and beans and peas and marigolds, pansies, lettuce, carrots, tomatoes, dandelions, grapes, pecans, and on and on. Uh, again, back to those leaves, the corn with a single leaf coming up like that, where is your dicots with the veins coming out? where you will see this in your seedlings in when they're coming out of the ground. You will have your differences that you'll see right there as opposed to the multiple leaves between the monocots and the dicots. This may matter if you fail to label what you planted in the ground. <laughs> so you'll need to know what you, you have there. All right. Starting seeds. Uh, what Kay talked about earlier is uh, we need to uh, have a good, clean environment for these seeds, for these brand new living organisms. They, they're starting out, they need the best possible environment, and part of that is having either new pots or sterilized pots. Um, and here's a uh, brief uh, uh, recipe to clean them. And that's just talking about, and it's talking about your tools too, that you work with. Here are various examples of containers. Um, again, we can reuse these, um, get them cleaned up. If you can get a hold of the, if you really want to get busy and planting a bunch of, of seed at one time, you can do that. You can make your own. Then you don't have to worry about the clean environment. You just have to worry about the soil. Or we can do it all in one, and then we've got to uh, gingerly get those out. So, all right. And then talking about the disinfecting. One more. Uh, guys, it just, I, and Claire, if you're going to cover this later, I apologize, but if you have old pots, that doesn't mean you can't use them. Mm -hmm. you, you, when they talk, talk about disinfecting, we're not talking about putting them in a sterilizer in an operating room. We're talking about about a 10 to 15% Clorox solution in water and soaking them for a few minutes and making sure they're really clean. Okay. Mm -hmm. Air dry. Air dry. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, so yesterday I was at a room gate and I told her, yeah, you know, I've got a few terracotta plants, uh, pots, and they got this white lining. Do I need to get all that out of there? And they said, no, that's calcium. Now, it might affect how much oxygen goes in that place, but mm -hmm. they're still good to use. Mm -hmm. So, okay. okay. All right, so yes, there's there's just a bulk example of, of putting them in the solution. You're not going to scrub them. You're just cleaning that surface or uh, killing that surface. Yes. Okay. This uh, can I like take a big bucket with that solution and put one seed tray and take it out and then put another seed tray? I can reuse it over and over. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good. To a certain extent. <laughs> to a certain extent. Right. Eventually, the chlorine will evaporate out of the water. Eventually. Okay. All right. And then the other part of the equation, the soil. Uh, you want to use a good soil. Uh, again, it's about the best environment for that new seedling. Uh, we today have prepared the soil mix for you. Uh, 
and you want it to be damp but not drenched, but you don't want to be powdery fly away. And the one thing we are not adding to this is fertilizer, not at this point. It's, it's new, it's tender. We don't want to burn it with fertilizer. Um, there are various recipes on the components, percentage ratios of these, and that's where you can ask advice from other master gardeners, read up on it, or come up with your own uh, formula. And, and you can just buy potting uh, seed starting mix. I've seen that out there too. Uh, some of the conditions for the seeds. I am missing another slide. There are lots of things we have to think about before we even start to do our seed. We need to think about uh, the, the growing season, the temperature. It's August right now. Or you're not going to put something out in August heat right now. Uh, how about your water? How long does it need to germinate? How long does it need to come to uh, fruit uh, or bear or bloom or whatever? So you have to think about these things in advance. Uh, I know like the master gardeners uh, here in the Big Red Barn Garden, they're thinking about their fall planting and they've already got their plans laid out, where they're gonna put things. They've got their seed already started and they're going to transplant their seeds, I think this Friday. They've been working on that for a month or two, back when it, it was really hot. So when you have needs for uh, things, you need to plan in advance uh, with all of the materials and time, and temperature, and water in advance. Uh, here's an example of heating mats. We might need this if we're planting some seed in December or January that we're gonna use in the spring, we might need heating, heating mats. And uh, some people in here that have uh, greenhouses, they might be needing these. It's up to you if you get to that point where you need them. Humidity, we need to control the humidity on some seeds, some plants. Not everything needs to have uh, humidity, but you, you need to read up on it and uh, check and see what it what it needs. Here's a uh, low key way to do some uh, controlled humidity, and we can we will be doing that outside. Uh, another thing, uh, some of them may need more air circulation instead of too much humidity, or maybe we're we're just loaded down with humidity. This is a way to help control it. Light, we. Uh, Again, like in December, January, we've got low light, uh, sunlight during the day. We may need to improve it and have it uh, under grow lights. So with all these conditions that we've got to work with, heat, humidity, circulation lights, we will have a future class touching on greenhouses and they will help with a, a long way to control that environment as opposed to having them out on the back porch. Um, watering, we need to keep the soil moist for the seed when they're starting out because we don't want them to dry out uh, when those roots are just starting. Everything is so, so tender. You don't wanna shock them with the water temperature. And again, that fertilizer, we don't wanna put any fertilizer on them until they're just established and we're moving them up. Uh, I want you to look at your handouts at this time. I gave you a uh, one on a milk jug seed starter. It's a look. It's a single page. It's a single page. And then the other one is the uh, grow seedlings handout. Yeah, it's it's not in the flip tab that uh, so that milk jug, I believe the, the uh, Big Red Barn uh, Master Gardener should try that out. Yes. The, the milk jug, yes. It's a, it's a small scale, little bitty, controlled environment to try out some seed. Um, if, if, you're, if none of you, some of you have not ever done it, this is a good way to do a little control. You <coughs> keep your eyes on it, 
I recommend daily or twice daily. You don't want the thing drying out. You don't want the thing getting all mildewy and molded over too. So uh, that's a good thing to use. Now the other handout has lots of good details on what to do, what to watch for, what to uh, consider on the seeds. Uh, let me see here. There we go, look at that. Yes. All right. Um, one thing when we, we, I think we have some transplants out here. Just a little thing is we grab them by the leaves. To, uh, we're going to, uh, we're going to, when you have a, a seedling in here, you want to push it up from the bottom. There's a hole for the drainage. You want to push it up from the bottom, loosen up the soil. You know, just yank it out of there. The thing's tender. So you want to grab it by the leaves and not by the stem. And uh, if you can see the dog, you want to push it up. Push it up from the bottom and, and lift it up out of there. Because if we grab it by the <coughs> neck, the stem, make stem, we can bruise it, we can damage it, and then you're, you've lost your plant. A leaf can regrow itself, so that's something uh, to think about when you when you're transplanting your seedlings. You want to do that, and then you can start doing the light fertilizer on them. You don't want to burn them; uh, they're tender, still they're fresh and tender. But you want to give them a little bit. So uh, that's when you do that, and then the hardening off. So you want to take them from fresh and tender to getting them used to where they're going to go. And you don't want to just stick them outside, out the wind, out the full sun. You want to gradually move them out there and give them a little bit of the environment each day maybe and move them out. And then that will give them the strength in their structure to be able to stand up to the wind, to be able to handle that. All right. I think I can just a little bit more. Uh, we are going to be uh, planting red rushing kale in the, the little clam shells and also some basil. We talked about that. What is on these instructions is when to sow outside, one to two weeks before average <coughs> plant frost day. So here it's giving you a timing indication um, and how deep to plant it. Again, you need to know where in the soil you put the seed. You don't want to plant it all the way down if it needs to have a lot of light. Uh, thinning. Sometimes you may plant too many and they're going to be all close together. And the competition will be too much. So you have to do that hard, hard, hard thing of thinning them. That's, that's not easy. It's very hard. Um, and then, and then uh, you've seen the maps on the bottom when we need to worry about frost. And that's whether you're talking about vegetables or flowers, that, something that can freeze. Um, uh, Bill Nodine will be giving you a talk on fall vegetables, and he will have you a plethora of booklets with all the seeds that you can even think about. But uh, so if you get something like this, and you're welcome to look at this, uh, it is great to just read up on information to see what works and what doesn't work. <laughs> uh, that's my time. Um, I forgot, I didn't get to some things about, yeah, I, I thought it was going to be too fast. Anyway, uh, the you want to consider when you gather your seed how you're going to gather it. Some things are just going to fly everywhere. Your dandelions, not that we're going to gather dandelions, but just think how they, they just spread in the wind. Uh, so uh, like the blue bonnets, you have to catch them at just the right time before they, they do their popping. And anyway, you have to work on this, it's going to take experience. And so um, if we're ready, let's go outside. Yes? So as she said, we're going to go outside and 
we're going to, we've got tables out there, five tables, basically three people to a table, and we're going to do these three activities. Timekeepers start, you know, waving at me and saying, okay, you've been yakking too long. I had, uh, I was with a friend of mine the other day someplace, and she said, do you talk to everybody? And I'm going, well, not everybody. Some people won't talk. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to talk about asexual propagation. Claire got to have all the fun. So this is, what do you do when you're not having sex? Um, so things that don't require seeds, okay? And, and um, Basically, there are a number of different categories. We'll be exploring almost all of them. Uh, we'll get to do some of them. Uh, one is layering and air layering, which I'll go into more depth. Division, which Cynthia will go into more depth. Uh, those, those are what you might call low hanging fruits. They're easy. Okay. Uh, then bulb chipping. Now we're going to be doing using bulbs for division today, but we won't be doing bulb chipping, but I will talk about how to do it, should you want to. Um, cuttings, which we will be doing today. Yeah. Uh, and roots, grafting and budding, and tissue culture, which we're not even going to talk about. I need to take it off of there. That requires lab conditions. Okay. Okay, now you remember botany that you had last week, right? The reason that I have this up here on this island of the flow of, this island is the exterior one, and the flow of is the food. Food comes from where? From a plant? It's not from the roots, despite our fertilizing. Yes, it does help, but it comes from the leaves. And it goes downward to the roots to help the plant grow. The xylem, is where water goes up through the stem and, and evaporates, transpires on the leaves. Um, so, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but there is, when we talk about air layering, we talk about cutting through the xylem. Well, you want to cut through the xylem, but you don't want to cut through the flow. okay? So, the other thing I want to remind you, and I don't know how much Mark covered in, uh, in the, about hormones. Uh, hormones are growth factors for people and for plants. And um, they affect plant growth, the ability of the plant to flower and or produce um, food and root formation. And we'll be talking a little bit about using root hormone in just a second. Oxen is the particular kind of hormone that we're talking about. When you take a cutting, you want to remove what, I love it when they have technical terms, the apical bud, that is the top bud on the stem that you're cutting. Because the hormones are up there trying to grow and you want them to go down so roots will be produced. Okay. Um, yeah, and that's why we use the root hormone. Differentiation. I know there is a pointer here because here we go. Is this node or bud? This is where the plant decides: Am I going to have a leaf, a flower, or whatever? And so when we take a cutting, we take it right below that because that's where the roots are going to form. That's where the hormones are. Okay? Right below the leaf, you're saying? Yeah, right? Let's see if I can do this again. See where this node is right here? Uh -huh. You cut right below, below it. it. Mm -hmm. Okay? Uh, that's because that nodal tissue has the greatest ability to do what they call differentiate. That is, instead of becoming a leaf, or instead of becoming a flower, I'll become a root, which is what you're looking for. 
Okay, is there a certain distance that you put it down? I mean, is it is it good to go a little bit below? Well, like slightly below. below. Slightly okay. below, so because if it. you go slightly below, then if you have to hold on to the cutting for any length of time before you put it in soil, you can recut. Okay. And you kind of want a fresh cut, because that's just going to be better for the growth of the plant. Okay. <clears throat> so maybe a quarter, half, quarter to half an inch below, but not a lot below. Yes. So, so unlike a succulent, don't let it dry. Don't let it dry. I'm going to cover that in just a second. Wet. Thank you. Thank you. Um, maybe it's, so let me talk about layering real quickly here. You're not going to get a chance to do it, but there are two different kinds. Uh, simple layering. You have a plant with a flexible stem. You fold the stem over. You put it on the ground. Sometimes you anchor it on the ground. You cover it up with soil. And that node that we were talking about? It does not soil. It grows a new plant. Mm -hmm. um, now, some of the plants that do this, rose, some roses. Now, generally, with roses, you're going to want heritage roses. That is, roses that are on their own roots. If you buy a hybridized rose, you may get it to grow but hybrid, anybody here grow, besides me, grow roses? Sure. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, it's been a summer. Yeah. Um, it, you may get it to grow, but they are, they are grafted onto other rootstock, which we'll talk about here in a minute, because their flowers are wonderful, look great, smell great, whatever, but their roots are not that strong. Mm -hmm. And so it's, you know. But tomatoes, there's no vegetables listed up here, but tomatoes do this great. Mm -hmm. um, so ivy, most vines will do it. So there's two different kinds of layering. Simple, that is you just do one down, and compound where you do multiples. Uh, it helps, and I knew I'd forget something, Paul, Right behind you, there's a blue bucket on the floor. Would you bring that to me, please, sir? I knew I meant to bring that up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I know. Okay. That was my good side. <laughs> Is that the good profile, Paul? So that it encourages the growth. Okay. Um, apply some rooting hormone to where you scrape. Oops, that's not what I meant to do. Go back. A little too fast there. You need to be careful with. That getting a preview of what you're doing. Was that banana leaves? Please? I'm gonna get there. I mean it managed to go. Wow. It did Way its forward. Forward. Yeah. Anybody here ever done air layering? No? 
air layering is where you take a plant uh, and you cut through, I told you where you cut through the xylem, all the way around the stem, through the bark and the xylem, all the way around the stem. This is fun. Uh, and then what you do is you take some sphagnum moss, get it moist, you wrap it around the wound. Excuse me, <coughs> sinus strange. Well, I got a little ahead of myself. You take some rooting hormone and put on the, the wound. And then you wrap the sphagnum moss around the wound. You cover it in uh, with a, like a cut up plastic bag or kind of heavy plastic anyway, not saran wrap, something heavier. Seal it at the top and the bottom. Now, you want to deseal it so that you can open it again fairly easily because you want to keep that sphagnum moss damp. So you may have to open it, check it, mist it to keep it damp. And what is going to happen is where that cut was, roots are going to form. And then what you do when, the, when you take the sphagnum moss off and you see the roots is you below those roots, you cut that plant off and you take the rooted new plant, put it in soil. Now you have two of the same thing. Okay? And your exact same thing. Exact right? same thing. Yeah. One of the things about um, doing asexual is you are cloning a plant. There's not going to be any variation uh, or anything. You're cloning. Uh, and so it's going to be the exact same plant. Other particular plants that you would want to do that process with versus the other process? I'm sorry, my hearing. Is there a particular set of kind of plants that you would rather well, do? Well, I, I, I have found it works best with like house plants and stuff, even bakia, things like that. I honestly haven't tried it on anything else. Okay, division, which Cynthia's going to get into in a little bit, is easy. Sort of easy. Oh, I didn't bring my pruning saw. Are we going to need my pruning saw? Sometimes the roots that you want to divide are not what you call amenable to being pulled apart. But basically, the process is simple. It's easy. It's straightforward. Thing to keep in mind is when you do it. Now, we're going to be doing a bunch of stuff that this is not the ideal time for. Of the year, yeah. But, yeah, in terms of of the year. Uh, and so just you know, keep your fingers crossed on it. But ideally what you do is if you have a spring blooming plant and you're going to divide, you divide it in the fall. If you have a fall blooming plant, you will divide it in the spring. Okay? Give it time to get established before it. Cloth grafting. And this is used when the when the uh, roots, we talked about roses a minute ago, when the roots of the plant that you really want are not really strong enough, so you graft it onto the roots of an older plant, but the produce is not what you want. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so basically what you do is you take the older plant, you split the stem, you take the cutting from the newer plant, and you, you make a V, and you stick it in the split. And you wrap it up. That's the process. Question. Bud graph, yes sir. You have to use the same, that's the same plant or those two different plants? Two different, two different plants. Two different types of plants. What you've got is a rootstock that you want the roots of. Usually it's going to be an older variation of this one. Now it's going to be like a rose. It's not It's not going to be an Esperanza you're putting a rose on or something. Right, a rose and a rose. Yeah, rose. it's rose and rose or whatever you're doing. Uh, but it's, it's two different plants. It's not... Okay. Um, Budstock, yes. 
So I've seen the to a tomato with the potato on the bottom. Uh huh. How do they do that? How how big is the stem? Yeah, like like you know how they sell like they say the tomato's growing up here, then the potato can grow down well, here. Well, your 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 rootstock is one. Have you ever looked in the rows? There's a knot down at the bottom, just above the roots. That's where the graft is. Yeah. Okay. The the cutting that you're going to put on is going to be about that tall. is a little different. In a bud graft, you're going to take, instead of a cutting, you basically, that node, that bud on the stem, you're going to cut behind it and take it entirely off the plant that you want. And then you are going to wound the plant that it goes on with a T. Peel the bark back. Stick the bud in and then wrap it. And then the roots are going to grow from that wrapped area. This means that you can, and this one, what they've got here is an example of a fruit salad tree. You ever see the trees or the, the plants that have multiple kinds of things on them? Mm -hmm. That's because what they did is they took a bunch of buds and put it on the same stem. And so when you planted the roots, you've got the roots of all the plants. And when it grows, you've got roots and like different all plants. different kinds of things on there. That has to be apples to apples. Okay. okay. How, how early or how late can you do something like this? Does the, does the tree need to be fairly young? You don't want a real established one because you're going to be using a sapling basically anyway. You need a young tree. Or a young plant. Um, so that's bud graft. Okay, let's talk about some basics. Some advantages and disadvantages of asexual using cuttings, particularly. First off, it's fast. Cutting you have to plant fast. Um, it's simple. As, as we talked about earlier, you're cloning your plant, so uh, you have uniformity. I want this, I'm going to get that. If you use um, seed propagation, particularly things that need to be pollinated, you don't know where those little pollinators have been. You know, they may be bringing that pollen in, and you're going, well, that was not what I ordered. <laughs> Um, in this, you're going to get exactly, exactly the same thing, um, and it's going to get mature faster. Disadvantages: you're not going to get that nice surprise uh, that would, that well, I, that wasn't what I ordered, but gosh, it's nice. Uh, and potentially can be more vulnerable. Like every time you clone something, the genetics get a little bit weaker. And so it can be potentially more vulnerable to insect and diseases. Some things that you need. Um, everybody brought printers, right? Yes, ma'am. Well, if you didn't, I think we have some out there that we can lend you. I do remember when I took my Master Gardener class all those years ago. One of my classmates, who shall remain nameless, because uh -huh. you might meet him, the instructor said bring printers. Didn't say hand printers, said printers. Yeah. And, <laughs> yeah. All <laughs> over his shoulder, floppers. <laughs> nice. Um, depending on the size and tenderness of the plant, scissors of different sorts. My favorite tool. Um, breeding hormone, 
A mister is nice, and to fertilize, but to fertilize, to sterilize your tools in between uh, some hydrogen peroxide and or chlorox. Okay. Media? 50-50, ideally, 50-50 mix of um, perlite and vermiculite. Now, I have to be honest, I've done lots of cuttings, and if I happen to have perlite and vermiculite, I use it. Otherwise, I use a good quality potting soil that works fine. Um, you need to keep things sealed up, and that's because things blow in and can contaminate your soil. Um, I'm going to just go through quickly a few different kinds of containers you can use for starting cuttings. One is what's called a storage bag terrarium. You can have, this happens to have Dixie cups. Uh, that can be a can, it can be a pot, it, it doesn't make any difference. Okay. Um, start your ceiling and you put it in a plastic bag that you can seal. And why do you want to seal it? Moisture. Moisture. Exactly. You want to keep moist. You want a plastic bag as opposed to just building something over it. You want something easily open so that if you need to re-moisten and mist, then you can do that and close it back up. Would that be something that we do with our basil and the esperanza when we get it home? If you took the cutting as opposed to the seeds, yeah. yes. Okay. Uh, no, no, this is what we call a self-watering propagator. You'd have a big pot, and then in the center of it would have a little, and this is a little terracotta pot. You seal the bottom of the big pot, you put soil around it, you put the little one in there, you put your cuttings in, and you water in the terracotta pot and the water spreads out. But I will say, when I've done this, sometimes you also need to mist. Does, does the terracotta yes. plant have a hole in it, or does it just absorb through the plant? I'm sorry. Does it have a hole in the bottom of the terracotta? The terracotta pot does, okay. but you've sealed up the, the hole in the bottom of the, the big pot. Yeah, so that, yeah. Well, I'm we, sorry, we, Cynthia, I'm wrong. We, we right. do seal the terracotta pot. We do uh, seal the terracotta uh, pot. Uh, it's gonna, the water's going to seep through the clay on the sides. Yeah, we want the operation to go just out. Just take a hot glue place. gun and Don't worry, my head seal goes. it up. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, I'm going to go quickly through some different kinds of cuttings. The one we're going to do today is stem cuttings. That's the most common kind. There's also leaf cuttings, leaf bud cuttings, and root cuttings. Um, so, anybody here a begonia person? All right. Do you have any Rex begonias? Yeah. Yeah? Well, Rex begonias are a beautiful plant. <clears throat> and they have big leaves. And you can, I've done this, and it works really well. You can take a leaf off a Rex begonia and you cut it on the veins into pieces. <coughs> Um, 
root cuttings, you take the root of the plant and cut it up. You stick in that case, you're going to put it horizontal in the ground. Okay, stem cuttings. Depends on when you're taking the stem cutting. Uh, again, ideally, we're going to be asking you to take some cuttings that ideally you would not be taking in August. Okay. <laughs> um, but you want to look for semi-soft wood. You don't want new new growth, but you also don't want hardened off. Um, and early spring for certain things, late spring and summer for other things than we are where? <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, you can take a basic cutting, which is basic what we're going to be doing now, what's called a heel cutting, where you take that node, that bud, and include it in the cutting and you peel it away from the, the uh, uh, parent plant. Okay? Um, a basal cutting uh, where the shoot severed at its base all the way down, and what's called a mallet, which you're taking a leaf and burying it with a piece of the stem. So, okay, hardwood cuttings, you're not going to do today, or you want to do in the winter when when the tree or plant is uh, dormant. It will be winter one of these days, right? <laughs> okay, so you don't want the unripe soft or green wood. You want this season's growth. Okay, so it's it's mature but not old. That's how I like to think of myself. I'm not sure that's correct anymore. <laughs> okay. If you're if if you are uh, <clears throat> when you're selecting your cut, uh, you want to make sure, if at all possible, that the plant's healthy that you're cutting off of, not disease, not insect ridden, you know, healthy, uh, vigorous. Ideally, again, you would water the day before the cutting. Um, take them early in the morning. We're doing this. Okay. <laughs> um, you should either, if you're not, in our case, we're going to go ahead and pop them up immediately. But, uh, but if you're not, you need to keep them moist. Uh, plastic bags and damp paper towels work great for this. If you're really going to be delayed, put them in a refrigerator or a ice chest or a cooler, not right on the ice, but where they're going to stay cool. Again, ideally, you would recut the stem under warm water. I'm sorry, are you all hearing those things? Yes. Mm -hmm. I thought I had this. I belong to several different organizations I do volunteer work with, and sometimes they think you need to talk to you right now. <laughs> um, you would recut the stem, these stems uh, uh, under warm water, but although if you want to, we do have a hose out there, and the water out of the hose is warm enough to so it's warm enough to steer the Okay, so you're going to cut the flowers off. Now this is really hard for those of us who like flowers. It's really hard. I've been known to apologize to plants at some point. I'm sorry. Okay, this is know. necessary. Mm -hmm. um, everybody thinks I'm crazy. I talk to my plants. So they're beings. Yeah. Sometimes they talk back. That's it's okay. really scary. Uh, but when a plant is flowering, they're putting their energy into producing the flower or the fruit or whatever it might be. And you don't want it putting energy into doing that. You want it putting energy into producing roots. 
So you're going to cut the flowers off. You're cutting. Um, if you have a plant and you're doing it has large leaves, cut the leaf in half. Um, just cut off the top part of it. Again, that's so that it puts the energy not into maintaining that leaf, but into uh, developing the roots. Uh, so, the stem just below the node, if you learn nothing else, is cut it below the node because the node is critical for the growth of the new plant. Remove lower leaves. There's the cut the larger leaves thing. Okay, if you have something with a lot of leaves and it's really narrow, like a rosemary or something like that, you strip the, the lower part of the stem. Totally. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to dip in rooting hormone. All of these you're going to dip in rooting hormone. Now, when I say dip in rooting hormone, you do not need an inch of rooting hormone on there. You're going to have a little container on your table. You're going to stick the stem in. You're going to knock the excess <coughs> off. All you need is whatever will stick to the stem. Heel cuttings is this, where you have taken the bud off and part of the bark on the, you see what I'm saying? So it's, it's going to be a, a plant that is being, you're cutting at a node where branches are coming together and, you're, and you want that. <coughs> If you have semi-hard wood, or hardwood for that matter, your little scraping tool, scrape the bottom part before you put the rooting hormone on. Apply the rooting hormone just a little bit. If you're using a can or a cup, or not a pot that already has a drain hole, as you learn from your seeds, you will um, make holes. It needs to drain. And then, these are what are called dibbles. <coughs> They're hole makers. You stick it in the soil and you go like that, make a hole so that so that you're not wounding the stem as you try and stick it in. Your finger works fine, pencils work great, depending on the size of the you just make a hole big enough to easily put the stem in and then you work the soil around the stem. We talked about that earlier. Okay. This is my favorite word right here. De-differentiation. <laughs> yes. Anybody know what de-differentiation is? <coughs> First time I saw it, I'm going, huh? <coughs> Plants have a wonderful ability to, at the nodal areas, to do what's called de-differentiating. That is, they take their cellular materials that would normally be a stem that's coming off or something, and go back to an early cellular level and become something else. Now it has to be the something else that would be inherent in the genetics of the plant. So, you know, it would be as if I, if I could do this, if I lost a leg and decided to grow an arm on my leg. But I couldn't grow an octopus mm -hmm. arm. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, 
So they do different shapes. They go back, they form a callus where you wounded, where the cut was, and then they will start forming initial roots. Um, so that's kind of the process. There's a test later, by the way. Do differentiations <laughs> on it. Uh. You know, I, I have threatened more classes with tests. <laughs> you want me to move on? Yes. Oh, all right. <laughs> um, so, rooting in, in water. Anybody here ever done rooting in water? Yeah, it's yeah. easy. It's, it's easy. fun to watch them get longer and longer, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So just make sure you change the water periodically. You don't want algae growing in it and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and then transplant. I'm moving, I'm moving. Uh, fresh cut. This is just pictures of the same thing. Mm -hmm. Leaf bud cuttings. You take the bud here and part of the stem with a leaf. And then you plant it horizontally so the leaf is up. Potting up. <clears throat> and you're ready for starting. I'm done. talking about plant propagation and the simple division that's really getting down into the dirt. The bag of cutting plants and everything. There we go. And, she, and it's very simple. Yeah, it is. <laughs> she's she's going to bring it to that and then we're going to go out and do some kind of out there in the, in the garden, okay? It's all that fun. presentation should have one in front of you okay uh, division uh, it, it's just a process uh, which plants are separated uh, we're, we're going to do there's probably about 10 plants out in the garden that we will be able to uh, simply divide uh, division is the easiest way and one reason why we can do this is Our plants are uh, spread by either rhizomes, corms, or bulbs. And I believe that some people had to buy a, took a piece of the arrow plant uh, that Tim had in a five gallon bucket. I believe that is spread either by corms or rhizomes. And uh, some of the, you can see the root, root on it of the rhizomes. So, um, Most plants uh, that you can divide will be clumping, and that, that is a key. Uh, we're going to do bulbine. You know what? Bul there's a plant called bulbine oh, you can divide. Uh, there are coneflowers. Giant coneflowers. Giant coneflowers. Not the purple ah, ones. Uh, ah. Giant <laughs> coneflowers. Uh, irises. Uh, we will have uh, bulbs that we can dig up. Uh, we will have bags available that you can put them in the, the lunch bag and take them home with you. Uh, as Kay was saying earlier, sometimes you need a chainsaw or a really big <laughs> saw to cut these roots. Uh, Kay did not bring her famous ferns uh, today, no. but um, she, you can divide ferns also um, into sections and, and multiply. Well, it's a hacksaw mm -hmm. yeah. a, a good general rule of thumb, uh, summer and fall blooming plants should be divided in the spring. Spring blooming plants should be divided in the fall. Foliage plants can be divided uh, whenever they outgrow their container. And that's also uh, when your container is bursting or has burst. It, it, that it, is an indication that it needs to be split into more groups. Um, I'm guessing, what's the definition of foliage? Does that mean leafy? Le leaves. Leafy, like, like a fern. 
Barn is an example. Um, it'll, has... it'll burst out of its container now. Um, it'll break a clay pot eventually. Mm -hmm. But uh, the green foliage. Plants that can be divided. Here's some more uh, plants. Uh, we've got grasses out in the garden. Um, I would uh, get with um, Beth on what grasses you could possibly take a sample of. Um, not the muley grass because they're about to bloom. We're uh, not, we're not dividing them. No muley grass? Okay. We have zebra grass that we could probably get a little off of. Okay. Um, we have irises, we have uh, some date daisies. Uh, our black-eyed Susans are uh, dried, we can't do those. Uh, we have uh, Greg's Blue Mist, we can divide. Okay. okay, Greg's Blue Mist, just for them, uh, very quickly, it's in the butterfly garden, not okay. in the heritage garden area. Right. We also have yarrow in yes. the butterfly garden that easy to divide, good chance of survival. And we have uh, shovels and spades available and um, forks. forks. Um, our cutting devices, uh, we have some uh, knives in our tubs, but I think that is the most dangerous thing right now we have. We don't have uh, hacksaws. <laughs> Okay, here are some material lists. Um, we, we talked about the, the knives. We always want to uh, pot our plant and uh, label it and put a date on it. This right here is a bulbine. You can, um, it has shoots and you could just pull them apart. I've got four in port containers uh, to show that to you when we get out to the garden. And um, we need some potting media. We've got plenty of that out um, at the garden. See how the uh, separate shoots right here? Mm -hmm. You would just pull that little clump off and that would be an individual plant. Mm -hmm. A lot of root structure. Uh, they're very forgiving. You could pull some of those roots off and they will still, still survive. Bullvine is in the succulent family. Uh, mine is uh, an orangish yellow mix, whereas the uh, bulbine that's in the garden, I believe she said it was yellow. Uh, you do want to protect it from uh, winter. Uh, they will freeze, so just before the first frost, either, either you cover it, protect it, or pull a clump out and put it away in the garage and then uh, replant it in early spring. When you pull them out and you put them in the garage, you don't do anything to them, right? You well, them. Uh, the soil's going to be moist. Uh, that's about the only thing is just keeping them moist. It's, it's from the succulent family, so it's... So you would, if they're in your garage, you would spray them? I would, keep, I would keep the roots moist. Uh -huh. I, uh, not, not super saturated yeah. wet, but just moist. Yeah. I, mine will survive until like 25 to 28 degrees. So if it's just a live freeze, they may be a little stunned, but they're going to be okay. But these last two winters where there's no way they're going to, they just will come up. It's down to 9, 10, 11 degrees. And so I just go and I have to just rip them out of the ground and wrap them in wet newspaper. And we have a closet outside, it's dark, and they can stay in there for about two or three months sometimes. Yeah. Wet them occasionally so they stay moist and they come out, they're ready to go in the spring. Garden closet. Like it's just like a closet. There's nothing special well, about it. It is. It, is, it doesn't freeze out. It's, oh, it's on a wall. Okay, I'll yeah. say yeah, but, yeah. Not like a shed. No, it's, no. Freeze, it's it attached to the house. Got so. it. Yeah. Yeah. So the temperature is probably above 40. It would oh, it's probably more like, like typically 40 to 50 at the lowest. Okay. So here's just a sample of it. Cutting it. I just, I just grab it from the base and pull. Picture, dividing the clumps. And that dividing is kind of fun too. If you go to a garden center and you start looking at the pots, you can get two or three out of one. I, I do that myself. I figure out how many 
How many plants can I get out of this one? <laughs> So in that picture, there's like three or four all connected. It's better to plant it like that, or is it better to like divide each one into a separate? Either or. I, I myself, I would take each individual stem, as long as it had root structure on it, and plant it, pot it up. But uh, if you want a larger clump, or a, a larger show of uh, green and blue, you can put more together. Okay. Yeah, another question. Yes. So I did that yesterday. I rescued a um, succulent from HEB that was a bunch of, and it lost its pot. And um, so there's many of them in there and they're really big. My thought was, um, well, it told me, <laughs> I talked to it, and it told me, <laughs> it's been in HEB at 70 degrees. I can't quite put it into the pot outside. Put it in the shade. Under a tree. Is that even the ones in the shade? Are you sure? It's hot. It's hot. It's hot. It's hot. It's hot. It's hot. From 70 <laughs> degrees of comfort, HEB temperature to underneath the tree. Under the tree. Uh, yeah, yeah, I know. took some time. I just don't put it on the tree. You need to acclimate your plants. Uh, give it yeah. yeah. out shade. Yeah. And yeah. once yeah. you, yeah. there's yeah. indication the plant is growing and surviving, then slowly yeah. introduce it to Texas heat. Yeah, I talked to all the other suffering. Even weeds. Yeah, I talked to them underneath the. Yeah. Under yeah. But, but that's that's a good thing to go. I like you know, you said I when I go buy plants, I look at every opportunity of how many I can get the most bang for my buck. What are so those are all the same? They're all grasses that were. Well, that was that was all bulbine. All. Five slides were bulbine. Okay. So tips on dividing plants: avoid placing small, slow-growing uh, plants into overly large containers. Uh, you may stabilize your divided plants in containers prior to replanting them in the garden or sharing with a friend. Uh, you may prefer to reset the plants immediately in the garden. Either procedure works equally well if plants are properly cared for after division. And I like to um, take my bulbine, and I have um, a brick planter on my porch, and I'll saturate it. Uh, it's really wet soil, and then I'll just go in there and just put my little pieces of bulbine in it, give it some shade, and then within two or three weeks, you'll see from the center of the plant new growth coming out. And that is the presentation. Okay, we have bulbs out there. And Beth, do you want to go over which bulbs we're going to be?